continuing our series of talks looking at various prophets from the Old Testament. Uh, last time we talked about uh, Elisha, and uh, the person we're looking at today is not one of the most famous prophets of the Bible. In fact, Obadiah is the shortest book in the Old Testament. It's only a single chapter, only 21 verses. It's very short. And most people probably haven't read Obadiah, I'm guessing. It's a rather short prophecy. But uh, today I'd like to take a look at the book of Obadiah and talk a little bit about who he was and what we can learn and what we can apply in our own lives from the message that he was chosen to share. Now, as far as the person Obadiah, uh, there's a little bit of controversy as to who actually wrote the book. According to Jewish tradition, the book of Obadiah was written by the same person that served as the uh, steward of Ahab's household. We talked a little bit about Obadiah during the story of Elijah. This Obadiah was the man who worked for the king. He was his household manager, uh, steward, and uh, he personally was feeding and protecting a number of prophets. There are Later Christian commentators believe that Obadiah was written by someone who lived four or five hundred years later. And even more recently, some commentators uh, place him as someone who wrote during the time of Alexander the Great. However, from most of the evidence, and from the fact that the Jewish commentators identify him with Obadiah from the time of Ahab, that is who I believe wrote this book and who most fundamental Christians accept as the author of the book. From Jewish history we know more about Obadiah than what's recorded in the Bible. Um, he was not originally an Israelite. He was actually an Edomite who converted to Judaism. He was a very wealthy man but he used all of his money to uh, pay for the support of these prophets that he was protecting. And uh, eventually he ended up having to borrow money from Ahab's son to continue to support himself. Uh, the date of the book of Obadiah uh, is probably from about the middle of the 8th century, around 856 B.C., and it talks about events that took place during the reign of uh, Jer Jeroam, who was the son of Ahab. The book of Obadiah is mainly focusing on the kingdom of Edom and its prophecies against the kingdom of Edom for their behavior and their sins. Now, who were the Edomites? Anybody remember? Esau's descendants. Okay, exactly. The Edomites were descendants of Esau. So they were relatives of the Jews. They were cousins. They were related by blood. And if you remember the history of the Jews, when they were on their way to Canaan, they asked permission to go through the territory of the Edomites, and it was rejected. And because they were related to the Edomites, God forbid the Jews from attacking them. And so they had to go all the way around the country of Edom, further through the desert, a very long and difficult journey, to avoid having any conflict with the Edomites. Because they were related, and God did not want the Jews to attack their brothers. Uh, later, um, the kingdom of Edom was, um, they fought several wars with the Jews, and they were actually tributaries paying uh, taxes to the Jews 
during the time of David and Solomon. And in this time period, uh, the time of Ahab's sons, the Edomites had gone to war against the kingdom of Israel and Judah. It was a time of weakness. The Israelites had been defeated by the Syrians during the time of Ahab. So they were in a weak condition. And the Edomites saw this situation as a good opportunity to take advantage. Oh, they've lost their army, their king has died, uh, their country is weak. And during this time of turmoil and weakness, the Edomites attacked and raided and caused a lot of damage and destruction to the kingdom of Israel. And uh, because of these actions, God sent a message to Obadiah, which was a judgment against Edom for their, for their activity. And in the book of Obadiah, we have this spelled out in quite a bit of detail. Um, first of all, um, God, uh, well, God judges Edom for its pride. Uh, the Edomites, their primary city was the city of Petra. You all probably know that name. It's a very famous World Heritage Site today. Any of you who've watched Indiana Jones movies, part of one of the Indiana Jones movies was filmed there, the, on location at Petra. And uh, what do you remember about the city of Petra? Anyone? Where is it located? How do you get there? Is it easy to get to it? Wide open place? <coughs> No, the city of Petra is located in very narrow canyons. You have to go through these very narrow winding passages to reach the city. And so the city of Petra was very difficult to attack. It was a very strong fortification because of these very narrow passages. An army could not reach the city easily. Even if you had a lot of men, they had to go through these narrow passages in single file or two or three men wide. And so a very small force could easily defend and hold off an invading army. And the city of Petra was considered invincible because of its location. And the Edomites were proud of their city and proud of their location. They thought that they were indestructible and immune to their enemies. And this pride was one of their sins which God spoke against in the prophecy against them through Obadiah. And Obadiah said that they would be completely destroyed. And at the time of this prophecy, that was something which most people could not imagine because of the sight of this city and the defenses of the city. And uh, Obadiah prophesied how they would be destroyed. It wouldn't be by external forces. They would not be destroyed by someone attacking them from outside, but it would come from inside, from treachery. They would be betrayed. And later in history, that is what we see happening. One of their neighboring tribes, who were their allies, they were friends. And these friends, while they were in the city, they suddenly turned upon the Edomites and destroyed them completely. And of course, if you go to Petra today, it's merely a ruins. It's no longer inhabited. It's a beautiful place to visit, but nobody lives there. The destruction was complete and thorough. The reasons that this judgment came against the Edomites is spelled out in Obadiah. First of all, they attacked their own brothers. God in his mercy had protected the Edomites from the Israelites for many centuries. And the Edomites had ignored that. And that led to Israel dominating them. And later, when the 
Edomites saw the Israelites in trouble, they took advantage. They went to war with their own flesh and blood, their own brothers. And uh, they did not provide assistance to their brothers. Instead of providing assistance, they attacked them. They were indifferent to the problems around them. Sometimes we have the same problem. We look at people and say, oh, it's not our trouble. The very famous story of Cain and Abel. God asks Cain, oh, where's your brother? Oh, am I my brother's keeper? Am I responsible for my brother? That was Cain's attitude. I'd have no responsibility. He's a free man. He's a, he's a grown man. He can take care of himself. And today in our world, there are many people who have that same attitude. Oh, he's an adult, she's an adult. Um, they have the means to take care of themselves. It's not my job. It's not my responsibility. I don't need to worry about other people. I just need to take care of myself. I can take care of myself, so other people should be able to take care of themselves. This indifference to the plight and the troubles of their brothers is one of the sins for which they were punished. And of course, they attacked and looted Judah and Israel, and they even enslaved some of the Israelites who were fleeing from their enemies. And so for these sins against Israel, against Judah, the people of Edom were held accountable. Now, at the time of Obadiah's prophecy, many people thought that what Obadiah said was simply crazy. It could never come true. And it was only many years later, centuries later, that this prophecy came to be fulfilled. God's prophecies are not always fulfilled in the time settings that we would like. When we looked at the story of Jonah in uh, a sermon earlier, you know, Jonah was sent to Nineveh, and he was hoping that Nineveh would be destroyed. You know? Forty days and Nineveh will be destroyed. That was the prophecy that he preached. But Nineveh repeated, or repented of their sins, and so God did not destroy them. However, when Nineveh fell back into its old ways, eventually judgment did come. But that was only 50 to 100 years after the time of Jonah. Jonah never lived to see those prophecies come to pass. Just because God does not act in the time frame that we expect, that does not mean the prophecies are not going to come true. We can look throughout the Bible and see many prophecies made against countries and against people that did not come true in a very short period of time. Some of these prophecies were hundreds of years, centuries in advance. We look at the book of Daniel where we have the prophecies made of these various kingdoms. Daniel made prophecies of kingdoms that would exist 600 years after his time. God's time is not the same as ours. And we should not expect all of the answers and all of the results to come at our convenience. At the close of the book of Obadiah, Obadiah talks about the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is a time of judgment and a time of reckoning. And Obadiah is one of the is the first prophet to use this phrase. And it was this idiomatic expression was used later by other writers, both in the New and the Old Testament. Of course, the day of the Lord that Obadiah was looking forward to was the second coming of Christ. And at this time, final judgment and final rewards would come. It's not always easy to, to look at this delay and accept that delay. We like to see things done immediately. Today we live in an age of instance 
and convenience, especially in Japan. You know, <laughs> convenience stores. One, two, three, four. <laughs> You know, in my neighborhood, there are probably six convenience stores within about five minute walk from my apartment. So if I go to one and don't find what I like, I can go to another, you know, sort of walk around the loop until I, oh, okay, here it is. And they're open 24 hours a day. Supermarkets near my house, open 24 hours a day. Every day of the year, even New Year's Day, holidays, they never close. We live in a society which provides us instant gratification. If we want something, we can get it. With the internet, we can order and shop without ever leaving our house, and they will deliver it to our house the next day, or even the same day in some cases. We want everything now. We want everything immediately. That is what we have become accustomed to in our society. The Bible prophesies that that would happen, that as the time got closer and closer to Christ's coming, that man's society would get faster and faster. That we would become less and less accepting of delays and times. And as we look at our society today, this is the problem that we have. Many people look at Christianity and the stories of the Bible and the prophecies and of the prophecies of Christ's coming and they say, oh, it's never going to happen. They've been saying this forever. And of course, this was prophesied even in the New Testament, in the, the writings of Peter. You know, they talk about, well, there will be scoffers in the last day. Where is he? Where is his coming? The day of the Lord is coming. We do not know the exact time. We do not know the day or the hour. But we do have the signs that point towards this day of the Lord. And we need to be looking for these signs and aware of these signs. And we also need to remember that the day of the Lord will come quicker than we expect. And even if it does not come in our lifetime, Many of us have grown up hearing, oh, Jesus is coming soon, Jesus is coming soon. I can remember when I was a little kid in elementary school, you know, people were like, oh, he's going to come for the next ten years or the next five years. You need to get baptized now and be ready. <coughs> Setting dates is not a practical thing to do. But... We only have our lifetime to prepare. When we talk about Jesus is coming soon, even if he doesn't come during the time that we live, the next thing we will know will be judgment. A resurrection. We need to prepare ourselves. We need to prepare ourselves every day. No one knows how much time they have. In the book of Obadiah, we have the promise of judgment. We have the reasons for judgment the description of judgment, and the future deliverance or restoration. Each of these steps is described as it relates to the kingdom of Edom. And as Christians, we can look at these steps and realize that these things are applying to the world today and to us as individuals. The problem with the Edomites was one of pride, and that is a source of original sin. Lucifer was proud, and that pride led him into rebellion against God. Pride is the first step towards sin. 
when we look at ourselves and we think of ourselves as better than other people, as above the law, we are on dangerous ground. And sin is a downward path. When Jesus talked about the choices people make, he described two paths. One which was narrow and steep and going up, and one which was broad and going down. People naturally follow the path of least resistance. It's like water. If you pour water, where does water go? Does it go uphill? No, not unless there's a lot. <laughs> it's forced up by physics. You know, usually if you pour water, you can you can quickly see, you know, where there's cracks or indentations, or if the floor is level, because the water will follow wherever wherever gravity takes it. Water follows gravity, and gravity goes down. Water follows the least res the path of least resistance, and that's what human nature is like. If we allow ourselves to follow our human sinful nature, we will follow the path of least resistance. And that is one which goes down into destruction. The Edomites followed this path, and it led to the destruction of their nation. And if we follow the path of least, of least resistance, if we follow the easy road, we too will face destruction in the end. God's word is true, and God keeps his promises. Just as in the prophecies of the Edomites, four or five centuries passed before these prophecies came to pass. And the prophecies about Christ's coming, the prophecies of judgment, the prophecies of reward, those things will come to pass someday. Just because they aren't happening immediately, or as quickly as we would like, does not mean they are not true. God will punish sin. That's not a popular idea. There are many Christians today who reject the idea of ultimate destruction. There are some Christians who believe that before Jesus comes, everybody will be converted. That all the world will see the truth and accept the truth and will choose to follow God. And while that's a wonderful idea, a wonderful dream, that's not the reality the Bible paints. When we look at the message of the Bible, it talks about a remnant. A small number of people will be saved. And when we look at the scenes of Revelation describing judgment, it doesn't say, everybody is judged righteous. <laughs> and even Jesus, when he spoke about judgment, he didn't say, there were all sheep and no goats. <laughs> there are all good wheat and no bad weeds. In every parable that Jesus spoke about judgment, there was a separation, a division between those who were righteous and those who were not. Those who are not righteous will be destroyed. That's the hard truth. And unless we come to terms with that, unless we are preaching that and teaching that, people are not going to know or care. Well, if everybody's going to be saved, I don't need to do anything. If all paths lead to righteousness, I can just follow the way I want. And that's really what the world teaches today. And this is what Satan promotes, the idea that you can do whatever you want and you're okay. You can go any way you like and everything is fine. But as the Bible makes very clear, and as illustrated in the book of Obadiah, there is destruction. And it will not be partial. It will not be 
slight, it will be complete and it will be permanent. There will be nothing left. And the Bible talks about this in Revelation where it says, you know, sin will be remembered no more. The memory of those things will be forgotten. As Christians, we need to remember these points. It should motivate us, not necessarily out of fear, but out of love. Love for our fellow man and our love for God. To live in harmony with Him and to share the warnings of these things to the sinful world in which we live. And so, in closing, I'd like to say that although the book of Obadiah is not uh, the most famous book in the Bible, the message that it has for us is very relevant today. <clears throat> that there is judgment that is coming. <clears throat> And we need to prepare for that, or we will face the consequences. I'm so glad God make us go through the old judgment. Amen. Thank you. <laughs>